we're going to talk about citric, uh, cyclic electron flow. So as implied before, the non-cyclic electron flow, where the electron went through at one time, um, we said that it yielded the same amount of ATP and NADPH. Well, it turns out for the next part, that is part two, where the, we're using the energy of ATP and NADPH to make sugars, that we need more ATP than we do NADPH. So um, the discovery then was that the electron actually does a little extra loop, de loop, um, from photosystems one back through the electron transport chain associated with photosystems two to create more hydrogens um, building up within the thylakoid space and generates therefore more ATP. So it actually, um, if you look at how an electron really flows then, it's gonna go up like this, you know, be excited like we were talking about before, um, flowing down, pumping hydrogens across the membrane for the making of ATP, up to the primary acceptor from photosystems one, and back to, through the, um, the electron transport associated with photosystems two, pumping more hydrogen, and then collect it off in an NADPH. So I call that a little loop-de-loop. -loop. So it basically it goes like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So um, that little extra, extra cyclic electron flow is going to create the additional ATP needed for the next part of the process. Let's talk about the next part of the process. That is called the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle is um, a cycle much like the Krebs cycle, only in this case, instead of breaking down molecules, we're putting them together. So what's gonna happen in this uh, part of the cycle is that I'm going to input carbon dioxide into the cycle. Um, it's going to be picked up by a five carbon molecule called ribulose bisphosphate. So when I do that, that is when those two things are joined together, I get six carbon molecules that then immediately will be broken down into two three carbon pieces. So if you look at the numbers here, if I start with three ribulose bisphosphate and add three carbon dioxide, that gives me three six carbon molecules so that when I break them in half, I'm gonna get six three carbon molecules, okay? So this first one is called phospho, um, phosphoglycerate or phospho, phosphoglyceraldehyde, and that is also called PGAL. So it's nice to know that acronym because it's helpful uh, in exam questions, et cetera. Okay, so this part is what they call the carbon fixation part, where the carbon comes in, it gets fixed in a molecule, and then uh, makes this PGAL. Now the enzyme that, that catalyzes this is called Rubisco. It's a very, very common enzyme because photosynthesis is happening in a big way planet-wide. So it's one of the most common substances actually on the planet, that and cellulose. All right, so then the next part of the cycle is energizing, right? So I'm gonna use that ATP, the energy from the ATP, um, and I'm also gonna use the excited electrons to be added to this PGAL to make eventually uh, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, otherwise known as G3P, okay? Now those, uh, the G3P, this three carbon molecule can then be taken directly off and put together um, in, in, uh, with other ones and make whatever kind of sugar I want. These three carbon pieces, two of them can be joined to make glucose, four of them could be joined to make sucrose, I could join um, more than that of them and make starches, all right? So I'm going to use that G3P, this three carbon piece, to make my sugars. What's left over then is more G3P going back and in order to turn it into ribulose bisphosphate, it has to be reconfigured. It takes energy to do that. Okay, so let's talk about this for a sec. So this is called the regen phase, by the way. Okay, so, um, but, oh, I forgot to mention that this part, the energizing stage, is what they call the reduction stage. Why? Because it's taking on electrons, okay? 
Now this part over here is, um, is called the regen phase because I'm regenerating from G3P this ribulose bisphosphate that I need to start the process over again. If this has, notice there's, um, if I made six of these and I took one off, then I'm gonna have five left over. So how many carbons total? I have five times three or 15 carbons. And so I'm gonna reconfigure those 15 carbons into three five carbon molecules, All right? So this whole part, they're not really showing you what happens exactly. They're just saying it gets reconfigured into that. So the number of carbons stays the same. It's just gonna be rearranged and it requires energy, okay? Now this is for three, one uh, G3P. And the way our, di uh, our overall equation went, it was for glucose. So let's talk about how this works for glucose, okay? So I'm gonna back up here so you can take notes if you, if you like. Uh, for glucose, um, it's, the same, it, it's the same process, um, and I've just kind of abbreviated some things, but I'm gonna talk about six carbons coming in instead of three, because remember, for glucose, I need two three-carbon pieces to make it at the end, okay? So I'm gonna put those six carbons with six carbons of the ribulose bisphosphate. I'm sorry, with the five, six of the five carbon ribulose bisphosphate, and I'm gonna make a six carbon intermediate that immediately breaks down into um, three carbon pieces called PGAL. Okay, so in this case, the numbers go six and six added and split in half is gonna make 12 of these three carbon pieces. I then add the energy and I'm going to add the excited electrons in the reduction phase and make 12 G3P, two of which will come off to make glucose, and the other 10 will go be regenerated back to make the ribulose bisphosphate. Again, counting the carbons, I have 10 three carbon pieces, that would be 30 carbons total, and then up here I have six five carbon pieces also 30 carbons total, just the reconfiguration of the carbons that are present. This takes ATP. So this is two times the last diagram. And for glucose, um, we use 18 ATP total and 12 NADPH. That is six ATP here. Oh, I should have said 12, sorry, whoops. <laughs> Let me write that over. 12, 12, okay, <laughs> oops. So it should be 12 ATP over there and 12 NADPH. And then on this side, I have six more ATP. So six and 12 is 18. And then I have the 12 NADPH on this side, okay? So to recap, then I'm going to use Light in, in the light reactions or the light dependent reactions, I'm going to use the photosystems. I'm gonna use light to excite the electrons from water. That breakdown of water is gonna generate oxygen. And when I do that, at the end of the process, I get ATP and NADPH. Those are gonna be used to run the light independent reactions that will then make sugars using the ATP and NADPH and carbon dioxide from the air to then create sugars that I can then use for the cell, okay? So this is kind of an overview of the whole process. Now just a, a couple of little minor things is that um, in these reactions, uh, both the light dependent and light independent are happening at the same time Sometimes if this is happening very, very fast and I'm making lots and lots of sugars, I will store these sugars as starches in a starch plastid, okay? So sometimes in plant cells, you'll see a starch plastid right next to the chloroplast because there's a lot of photosynthesis happening. Of course, the sugars will later or could later be broken down into, in the process of cellular respiration like we talked about at the beginning.